Thank you for listening to Scandinavian Crimes Podcast. Be sure to check out the episode links and be part of our other social media platforms where you can leave a topic suggestion or even share some of your insights regarding the subject matter of the episode. We'll always do our best to provide a well-researched episode, but sometimes due to limited access, translation issues, and inconsistent evidence between multiple sources, there can be information that's lost. It is therefore good to do your own research and get a deeper understanding of a case of your own interest. So with that all said, let's start today's episode. Welcome to Scandinavian Crimes. My name is Devante and say hello to my lovely co-host, Delilah. Hi. And on this podcast, we cover famous Scandinavian criminals who made their mark throughout Scandinavian history. So welcome to today's episode where we will tell the tragic story of Benjamin Hermeson. I hope I'm saying that correctly. What is mostly known is the Honlia Honlia murder. I'm leaving all that in. I want you to know how I struggle for you guys. (laughs) All right. So on the night of January 26, 2001, Benjamin was brutally stabbed by members of the neo-Nazi group Boot Boys. This horrific act of violence led to the conviction of Joe Erling Jard Ule and Nikolai Kvisler. Uh, like I said, these names are interesting. <laughs> Why are you <laughs> and Veronica saying it like that? Andreasen. Andreasen. These names, I've never heard okay, these names before no. over here in the States. <laughs> no. We will tell the tragic story of Benjamin Hermanson and what is mostly known as the Holmlia murder. On the night of January 26, 2001, Benjamin was brutally stabbed by members of the neo Nazi group Boot Boys. This horrific act of violence led to the conviction of Joe Erling Jar, Ole Nikolai Kvistler, and Veronica Andreessen. See? Perfect. See? You should do the reading from now on. Okay. <laughs> uh, but you're going to really, it's not going to be a super long episode. You'll enjoy it. Uh, nonetheless, it'll still be a tale of caution for those of us out there. But nonetheless, you already know what to do. Grab your tea, grab your snacks. If you're on your way to work, tuck yourself into a nice little corner in the back of the train or on the bus. As we tell the story of Joe Erling Jard and Ule Nikolai Kvisler, the Honlia murder. Joe Erling Jar was born on November 11th, 1981. He lived with his mother and older brother in Buller. And from the age of 12, his mother started being frequently absent from the home. These absences were often long, leaving Joe and his brother to care for themselves. Although the mother occasionally returned to restock the fridge and leave money, the boys were effectively without proper care. Sometimes, other relatives offer some assistance. However, Joe had very limited contact with his father. At around 15 years old, Joe's brother moved out, and about a year later, his mother relocated to the United States. He briefly lived with his mother in the U.S., but he struggled to adjust and returned to Norway. Joe then lived alone, occasionally providing shelter to friends who had conflicts with their parents. He then attempted to live with his father at the age of 17 or 18, and later with an uncle, which were both unsuccessful. Ule Nikolai Kvisler, born on July 23, 1979, grew up in a typical family in Homlia with an older sister. At 15, his family moved to Prinsdal, where he lived until he was 21, and moved into the Buller apartment with Joe. In childhood, around the ages of 11 to 12, Ule was reportedly harassed by youth with foreign backgrounds. He described incidents of shoving, pushing, and general minor altercations, but also more serious events, which included being robbed. Much of his harassment was gang-related. At the time, Homlia had several gangs, and the relationship between them often divided along racial lines as white and black was marked by frequent conflicts and violent clashes. Initially, Ule's involvement 
with these conflicts stem from personal disputes, but over time, he developed a broader negative attitude towards immigrants and people from different cultural backgrounds. At approximately 15 or 16, Ule began reading literature about World War II and the American Civil War, which further entrenched his xenophobic views. Around the same time, he connected with far-right individuals in Nordstrand and quickly became involved in his extremist environment. At 16, Ule participated in his first attack on people of color and continued to harass and assault immigrants in the following years. He became a notable figure in Norway's far-right scene, especially within the Blood and Honor group. Beyond his racist and anti-immigrant beliefs, Ule was attracted to the camaraderie, uniformity, and glorification of violence in the neo-Nazi environment. Parties and alcohol also played a role in his attraction to this lifestyle. Joe first met Ule in 1999, but they became close in 2000 as Ule became more involved in the neo-Nazi scene in Buller. By December 2000, Ule, Eric Lauritsen, and Ule's girlfriend, Veronica Andreessen, were living with Joe in his apartment. Their apartment became a hub for far-right neo-Nazi movement, regularly hosting parties and gatherings. The apartment was adorned with Nazi symbols and propaganda, and weapons were extremely common. Ule often carried blunt weapons, while Joe typically had a knife. Ule also owned several firearms, including a pistol kept in the apartment and an AG-3 rifle stored with a friend. Joe deeply admired Ule. Seeing him as a role model, unlike Joe, Ule was strong, confident, and respected within the neo-Nazi community as a member of the Blood and Honor. While Ule may have not formally led Joe, he commanded his respect as well as loyalty. While Ule denied having a formal leadership role, there's insufficient evidence to label him as a leader beyond the natural influence of his personality as well as his actions. He was self-assured, outwardly aggressive, and physically strong qualities that likely gave him a degree of sway over others within the extremist environment. Joe has no prior criminal record, but has been fined once while Ule was serving a sentence. He had also been convicted three times before, including once in Sweden, and fined three times. On the afternoon of Friday, January 26, 2001, Ule received a phone call that upset him, making him extremely irritable. When he returned to the apartment, the situation was discussed further with Joe, Veronica, Eric, and several other friends from the far-right extremist circle who were present. After some time, Ule and Veronica decided to go for a drive, and Joe joined them. The trip was driven by Ule's boredom and bad mood. Before they left, there was talks of going to Lambertsetter to seek revenge on Moroccans for an incident Eric had recently faced. However, this plan was dropped when Eric chose not to join them. Among the three people who went out, there was a discussion about stopping, uh, stopping by a convenience store to pick up some items. They drove in Ule's older Ford Tannis, with him at the wheel, Veronica in the front, passenger seat, and Joe in the back. During the drive, Ule instructed Veronica to watch for dark-skinned individuals intending to intimidate or assault anyone they encountered. There is no evidence suggesting that a stabbing or murder was planned at this point. When they reached Asbroton in Honlia, Veronica saw 15-year-old Benjamin and Hadi outside the grocery store. Benjamin, born on May 29, 1985, was a Norwegian teenager of mixed heritage with a Ghanaian father and a Norwegian mother. Veronica alerted the others and Ule drove up to them stopping nearby. The atmosphere in the car turned tense and aggressive, and once outside, Ule and Joe immediately ran toward Benjamin and Hadi. Joe and Ule drew their prospective knives, which they equipped themselves for the trip. Benjamin and Hadi had noticed that they were there. There were two closely cropped individuals in the car and immediately recognized them as neo-Nazi. They exchanged concerned looks with each other and felt uneasy. When they saw Joe and Ule running towards them, they began to run as well. All of them ran down the walkway alongside the apartment building. After about 30 meters, the path ends at a fence blocking half of the walkway's width with a passage left of the turnaround area. 
Boulay caught up with Benjamin just before the fence and grabbed him. Benjamin briefly managed to break free, but Ule quickly recaptured him. After some struggle, Ule cornered Benjamin between the fence and the building. This happened partly because Joe blocked the passage next to the fence. Benjamin was thus trapped and Ule stabbed him in the back with a knife he was holding. The knife penetrated through his clothing and into the soft tissue of his back, creating a stab wound channel of 6.5 centimeters in a downward direction. Benjamin cried out as he was stabbed, and after the attack, he managed to break free and fell over the fence. Joe quickly joined him, pinning Benjamin down by kneeling on him and delivering two powerful stabs to his upper body. One stab pierced his right upper arm and the other entered his chest near the right nipple extending through the cartilage between the fourth and fifth ribs into his right side of the heart. Ule then ran to the car, reversed to Joe, picked him up, and they fled the scene at high speed. The stab wound to the heart caused immediate and severe bleeding, but despite this, Benjamin managed to stand and stagger for about 30 meters toward the turnaround area before collapsing and dying. The cause of death was exsanguination from a stab wound to the heart. After leaving Benjamin behind, Joe and Ule, along with Veronica, drove to Rustad School and parked at the, at the rear before returning to their apartment. In the apartment, they see on TV that a boy was stabbed and killed in Homlia. Ule, Veronica, and Joe agree that Joe should flee the country or they place all the blame on him. After seeing the news, Joe leaves the apartment and spends the night with an acquaintance. The following day, he traveled by bus to Denmark, where he remained until his arrest by Danish police on February 1st, 2001. Although he resists extradition, he is handed over a few days later. Ule and Veronica were arrested on the night of the murder as well. The Oslo District Court delivered the judgment on January 17th, 2002. Joe was sentenced to 16 years and Ule to 15 years in prison. Veronica was convicted of complicity in racially motivated bodily harm resulting in death, receiving a three-year sentence, six months longer than the prosecution's recommendation. Joe, Ule, and the prosecutor appealed the Oslo District Court's judgment while Veronica chose not to appeal, making the District Court's judgment final in her case. The appeal hearing took place at the Oslo Courthouse from November 11th to December 4th, 2002. The defendants attended and gave testimony. The court also received testimony from four court-appointed experts and 39 witnesses, including two expert witnesses. In evaluating the evidence, the Court of Appeal primarily relied on Hadi's consistent and credible testimony, which was central to understanding the events that occurred. His account of the incident, including the fatal stabbing of Benjamin, is corroborated by other witness statements, forensic reports, expert testimony, and some extent by the defendant's statement. The Court of Appeal is clear that Benjamin was pursued, attacked, and killed solely because of his skin color, making the murder racially motivated for both defendants. It was random and unprovoked. It was a random and unprovoked attack that led to a murder. While Ule initially suggested targeting dark-skinned individuals, Joe's acceptance and participation in this plan demonstrated that he shared the same racist motives. This is further reinforced by their connections to the neo-Nazi environment. At the time of his death, Benjamin was defenseless and unable to escape or protect himself from the defendants, both armed with knives. By the time Joe delivered the fatal stab, Benjamin was already on the ground and incapacitated from previous attacks. During the appeal, both Joe and Ule claimed to have distanced themselves from far-right and neo-Nazi groups. However, the authenticity of this claim is unclear, especially given Ule's letter to Joe from August 2002, which suggests otherwise. The appellate court deems it unnecessary to explore this further as these factors do not affect sentencing. Joe's age and difficult upbringing at the time of the murder were also mentioned. Despite this, Joe's sentencing was set at 18 years of imprisonment. While his involvement was secondary to Ule's, the focus is on the fact that Joe delivered the final stab and participated in the events without objection. Ule's sentence was set to 17 years in prison. 
Although he did not deliver the fatal blow, he initiated and actively participated in the pursuit and stabbing. Additionally, as a driver, he left the scene knowing Benjamin had been stabbed multiple times. Ule's prior convictions, including those for violence, further aggravated his sentence. Their appeal to the Supreme Court was then denied, making the Court of Appeals verdict the end of the trials. The community felt that the security of Honlia disappeared with the arrival of neo-Nazis, the place where everyone knew everyone had been infected by something they didn't want there, something that created a feeling of insecurity. But quickly, this feeling transformed into something else, unity and support both locally and nationally. The murder of Benjamin sparked widespread outrage across Norway, leading to nationwide protests, including a march in Oslo with nearly 40,000 participants led by the crown prince and the prime minister. It was one of the biggest commemorations in Norway after the Second World War. It did not only cause attention in Norway, but also internationally. Many major media reported on the case and several internationally known artists have taken it up. Even Michael Jackson dedicated his 2001 album, Invincible, to Benjamin, urging people to judge people by the character and not by the color of their skin. In Benjamin's memory, the Benjamin Prize was established in 2002 to combat racism, awarded annually on January 27th, coinciding with the Holocaust Remembrance Day, it honors schools that make significant efforts against racism and discrimination. In October 2021, the Deichmann Library in Homlia opened the Benjamin Room, a space dedicated to youth discussions on anti-racism and community involvement. However, the far right attempted to honor the perpetrators. Clara Dorothy and Watson, an Oslo woman with far right views, left money in her will to the Nazi sympathizers, controversially allocating 250,000 Norwegian kroner or around 400 uh, 43,000 uh, U.S. dollars to Ule. This sparked significant media attention and raised legal concerns. After serving their sentence, Ule returned to the neo-Nazi activities while Joe expressed remorse for his involvement in the murder. Before we start, I want to say this very specific thing and maybe... You, you might bring this up later, but I feel that this opinion of black people when he was young, right? Yeah. It stemmed from the fact that he himself was living in a crappy neighborhood. And what we've learned in history when it comes to like immigrants in a lot of different countries for some very odd reason, which is I don't want to get into, uh, when immigrants tend to come over to a country, they often live in those environments where there isn't a ton of resources, which as we know as a fact, will increase violence in the neighborhood because they're fighting for resources. So because he also was poor, you know, he was also alone pretty much. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm referring specifically to uh, Joe. His opinion. Uh, you mean Joe or do you mean? OK, yeah, I mean, sorry. Joe. Yeah. So, <laughs> Joe, like his opinion changed because he was living in an environment with other people who were also struggling just like him. And what happens when you're living in an environment where you're struggling, often violence will increase. So I mm -hmm. say all this is this is kind of how that rhetoric kind of gets to people like that. They associate their misfortune with other people who are also dealing with misfortune and it kind of sucks that instead of you know being like oh my parents are responsible for me being in this situation my dad my mom just left and that didn't work out she's living her life in the u.s like i'm i'm in this crappy environment you know, mm -hmm. but instead <clears throat> lashing out at somebody else for problems that had nothing to do with them. And even then, I'm, I know they said in the story like, oh, yeah, you know, there was bullying, blah, blah, blah. Um, I don't know if it's true or not. Um, so I'm, I can't I'm not going to discredit it. If I were to take it at its word, fine. Do you mean for Ulla? Because like the thing is, back in the day, 
there were a lot of like racial gangs and they just egged on each other. Right. So it was like it was an endless evil cycle between gangs and then they started attacking other people. So like basically Joe obviously could have been a victim of those attacks and when he saw that you know his white friends helped him out because they were part of the like neo-nazi gangs he felt a sense of belonging as you said so mm. like sure he was in an environment where he felt like oh i belong in this environment they got my back i have somebody i have a family the family i don't have like that i didn't have before and true and obviously after the sentence he started showing showing remorse and he started to distance himself from the neo nazi environment but i still believe like even though the circumstances i you know you should never commit murder like i show no mercy okay i don't like feel like i feel like because he went he got sentenced and he he served his time I think that's like that's that. Now we can like move on from it. Uh but I believe like obviously even if you're a victim of your environment, you have the choice to, you know, not become a criminal. Yeah, it's just oh, one yeah. of those things where I truly would like to understand what how, like the thought process because this even the life like that I've cult. lived. It's like when you get like you get brainwashed basically and you put the blame of everything and everything that sucks in life on somebody else. Yeah, and it's interesting because I'm like even the life that I've lived, my experiences, even if I may not feel comfortable around certain as comfortable around certain types of people until I feel like okay, they're cool. My first thought isn't to, oh, let me swing on them. Let me do this. Let me do that. Because it's like, you know, maybe, like I said, I'm pretty, we will get to it at some point. But I guess I'm rational enough to be like, these problems either have nothing to do with these random people or I associate my problems specifically with the individual or mm-hmm. with the whatever process or whatever. I don't I don't attach it to just random people who might look like somebody else, you know? So, but that's, that's just my little two cents, but you can go ahead. I just, I just wanted to get that out of my system, you know? Because, like, we, I mean, we could talk about the, like, psychiatric, uh, whoa. Psychiatric? <laughs> psychiatric. <laughs> oh, wow, I can't speak. The evaluation, uh, the... Uh, yeah, the te- the, they did tests they they test and check his character profile and his like mental health and the experts determined that joe had a ne- neurobiological personality and behavioral disorder that like basically impairs his ability to learn theoretical concepts think abstractly and follow rules and norms um but like despite these challenges uh his practical abilities and overall functioning is like above average uh and he like he does not have a general intellectual disability per se um so like because of his brain dysfunction you know it's present it's still possible for him to develop coping strategies or to manage it Mm -hmm. so like sure because maybe because of the environment he you know started having these uh like he started developing these personality or behavioral disorder and which is not uncommon and uh, basically he was in an environment that just made it a lot worse that's why he was like oh uh, ule is gonna attack this black person i'm gonna do it too you know yeah so that could explain a lot of like like he probably had or received help during his sentence time um and probably worked on himself and that's that's really good that he like changed uh, it's just unfortunate that somebody had to die for him to change and realize that or get help you know in general yeah and there was actually someone who testified uh you know joe's character and, and it was a friend of his uh or a childhood friend that grew up with him in Berlin. and uh, he basically described him as like someone who like uh like that 
you know, Joe helped, you know, hijab people or other like people of color, some mothers or stuff like that. He wasn't like he had he didn't have that hatred uh, that was later shown. Uh, it, or, and his friend basically suggested that like Joe, like when he encountered the neo-Nazi group, he wasn't like he, he didn't join them because of their beliefs he joined them because of seeking a sense of belonging and brotherhood so like there were evidence and profiling and you know stuff made uh and during trial joe was basically like i'm a victim of violence uh like i didn't do it because i wanted to basically uh and he was saying, like, when I was 14, I was assaulted on a subway by a gang of child robbers with a Somali background. And this is like, he's like saying basically what this friend was basically like, it's like, I don't know what he's doing. He's digging his own grave. And he's like, because of that, uh, that gang that attacked me uh, and the neo-Nazi helped me. That's why I feel like, you know, I hate black people. I hate people of color. So like... I don't know. I feel like he probably developed that hatred and he had that, but then he worked on himself probably and then ended up realizing that it's not black people's fault and stuff like that. Um, yeah, I it's, uh, I guess for me, it's hard for me to wrap my mind around stuff like this. Plenty of other things too, because I'm just thinking about how like, wouldn't like this to me it makes sense and maybe you know even though this is like 2001 when the, they got convicted and all that stuff but information was still available but either way i think my, naturally because i'm thinking with my mind now because in 2001 obviously i was alive but i was just you know seven you know so mm -hmm. to me it makes sense that when you're in environments that are not good violence is more likely to occur um you know, because like I said, that's you're fighting for resources. That's not just for black people. That's not just for white people. That's not just for Mexican, whatever your background is. That applies to any group of people. When you're in an environment with little resources, violence is much higher compared to other areas where they have better education and resources. Now, even if something like that were to happen and I live in New York City and like I said, New York City was a completely different place back in like 2001. And, mm -hmm. you know, if something were to happen, well, technically stuff like that did happen. It's just, you know, I'm not condoning violence, but, you know, you got to do what you got to do sometimes. Either way, when stuff like that would happen, like going to or from school, whatever, I didn't associate it with like a group of people. I associate it with those people, like specifically the people who did it. And I guess it's tough for me to understand other people who like, oh, someone did this to me. All of you must be doing this to me. When in reality, mm. you know, like we're human, just like how you can be a jerk. And then if someone would be like, oh, you're all jerks, then I guarantee you he would feel some type of way just like anybody else would feel some type of way. So I guess yeah. to me, conceptually, I just can't understand how people it's so easy for people to associate one bad thing in their life. And then be like, oh, everyone must be like this. But yeah. also that that's probably due to the lack of exposure. But then again, I'm pretty sure he was living in those areas with those people. He just didn't interact with them to get to know them as well. The thing is, like, what sucks about this whole thing is that, like, because of the gangs, it just never stopped. And I'm not talking about, like, the gangs who was, like, people of color gangs. I'm talking about the neo-nazi gangs versus the like people of color gangs because like yeah. last you read before previously eric was in a situation with moroccans mm -hmm. and they were like thinking of going there and have revenge and i was like like it doesn't like even even though like who started who we would never know because this is an endless like battle between both of these sections of gangs mm -hmm. so like i just feel like even though he's like i was a victim of the situation the same thing is happening with other people who's like people of color who was also affected and became victims of gang violence from neo-nazi groups and especially the, the boot boys 
What? And I was just basically agreeing. Like, they don't see it as the same thing for some reason. Yeah. Like, they only see, like, it's their fault. And I'm like, but you're doing this. Like, it's it's an endless battle. With, like, it's an endless war. Will This will never stop. And Boot Boy specifically, the neo-Nazi group, uh, that was uh, who uh, Ulle and Joe was part of, uh, they were the most aggressive group in Norway. And it was actually stemming from... Uh, I think it was like a U- the UK like the is a branch from the UK uh, uh, the UK group oh what's the name of it uh, Boot Boys um, is the Nazi group that Ola and Joe was part of and they that was the most aggressive neo-Nazi group in Norway and it was is it like a branch from some UK um, like uh, neo-nazi group there and it kind of like spread and there's a lot of branches so racism was a a huge thing back then and i'm not saying it's not a huge thing in the other scandinavian countries but in norway we've already been part of one which is you know anders breivik so racism or like neo-nazi group is a lot like this a huge it was used to be a lot or before but i don't really know how it is today um but yeah so they might be lurking somewhere i don't know yeah uh but it they did do a lot of precautions they did change after the benjamin murder and uh, they're still fighting super hard against racism and um uh, that's what i love about these cases you know even though it's unfortunate that somebody had to die for change they're still changing they're still trying to be better so yeah yeah so a little word of advice uh for people out there also too statistically i think on average women in general prefer more left men so gentlemen if you're listening what what is this a dating site what is no 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 I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna make a point it was just it popped in my head okay you know even if you feel you know these misunderstandings of feelings instead of acting on them why not you know figure out why you feel this way get the proper help so you can understand and see that these feelings are not you know rational that applies to anyone who has negative feelings towards a group of people um because also don't be afraid to explore and understand other cultures that's also like a thing being scared of yes that xenophobic that fear explore get to know the culture it's just like just like yeah. any but other human being gonna have bad people gonna have good people doesn't matter explore the culture understand the culture and just know okay yes people can do things differently whatever the case may be just be sure to keep an open mind when you're going through this journey we call life and if that's not enough incentive for you being a man if you're a straight man most women prefer you know pretty left men so hey, if you're not gonna do it for yourself, do it for the women. <laughs> <laughs> it's a joke. Okay, uh, thank way. you so much, uh, Devonte Johnson. Uh, I guess we're gonna have to <laughs> wrap this up right now. Uh, we love you guys. We appreciate the support you guys are doing, and um, I guess we're just gonna end it with a positive note. And uh, what would you like to eat, Devonte? What is your craving for the moment? Uh, you? I'm joking. <laughs> oh my God! <laughs> it's- uh, I would like to have some fries uh, and I would like to have my chicken nuggets that are in the air fryer because they're waiting for me. Uh, so, yeah. I would like the air fried chicken that I made. You know, that that would be good with the little they're gravy. They're really good, yeah. And then I, blow some I rice on there. Yeah, that's good. Some yeah. rice. That sounds good. Either yeah, way, guys, hope you enjoyed veggies. today's episode. And uh, be sure to check out the YouTube channel uh, where every three weeks i will be uploading these little psychological profiles of previous cases that we've covered so eventually this case will probably get on there but not now but eventually but go be sure to check it out it's on youtube subscribe you know click the bell do all that and uh i hope you enjoy the rest of your day peace out bye